Welcome, everyone. Hi. <laughs> For those I haven't met, mm -hmm. I'm Adam Grant. Uh, this is actually a special Authors at Warden, and I'll introduce Ingrid in a moment. But before I do, uh, this is actually combining two things that I love. One is sharing ideas outside of the classroom with people who are intellectually curious enough that they show up even when they're not being graded. Um, kudos to all of you, by the way. Uh, the second thing is, uh, not too long ago, I got approached by an amazing entrepreneur, Rufus Griscom, who said that he wanted to start a book club that would go virtual. And uh, he recruited me and Malcolm Gladwell and Susan Cain and Dan Pink and said, what if you all get together and help new authors get discovered? Uh, which is a huge problem if you're an author, by the way. You write a book, and 15 years ago, it would have been in the front of a bookstore, and then it automatically would get sold. Um, and there's really no good discoverability mechanism on Amazon. And so the thought was, if we could get together and, and pool whatever influence we have, we could identify books that we really loved and help those authors get traction. Uh, so we started this Next Big Ideas Club. Uh, it's, uh, it's been going now for a solid year at this point, just about. And uh, one of the things we do is we donate all our profits to uh, donating books for under-resourced communities. So uh, every book that ends up getting sold in the book club uh, goes to kids, uh, usually in underprivileged schools, who get to read them. And so um, Ingrid's book, Joyful, was actually one of our selections for the fall. Uh, so we are here to, uh, to hopefully donate some books. And we're recording this uh, so that we get to have conversations with all the authors as part of the Next Big Ideas Club. Uh, so that means, for those of you who have questions and want to ask them, uh, we're going to get you on camera with a mic. Uh, you can, you can <laughs> opt out if you so choose. But uh, without further ado, let me introduce Ingrid Fatel lee Ingrid, welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. As you all know, Ingrid is the best-selling author of Joyful. Uh, she comes from an illustrious career at IDEO, where she did brilliant design work. Uh, she also gave a wildly popular TED Talk uh, this spring. Uh, which she was not convinced would be wildly popular uh, in the True two fact. days before. True fact. <laughs> uh, but the rest of us were pretty clear that it was going to be a hit. Uh, so Ingrid, I want to start, I guess, at the beginning for me, which is uh, a few years ago I went to IDEO and gave a talk kind of sitting like this. Uh, and you came up afterward, and you told me about a blog that you were writing, which I just found riveting. Uh, I think it was called The Aesthetics of Joy. Mm -hmm. So what, how did you get started as a blogger, and what was that, and how did you make time for it outside of your day job, and nine other questions that I'll ask you in a minute. <laughs> oh boy, okay, okay. So um, I fell into blogging by accident. I, um, I started, I, I was studying at Pratt. I was studying industrial design, and I had this review where a professor um, looked at my work and he said it felt joyful to him. It made him feel joy, and I, um, and this was so, it's really weird to me because I had, um, you know, I had always thought of joy as this ephemeral thing. And so when this professor said this, I, it, it began this sort of process of inquiry for me where I started to try to, you know, the professors in the moment couldn't answer the question. And so then I set out to try to answer this question for myself. And blogging became a way, I actually... I think started a, a blog to sort of chronicle all my design explorations, all of what I was learning. And I quickly found that this question became the only thing I wanted to write about. And so I started another blog. So I, I had an initial blog, it was called Sketchbook, and it was just like where I scribbled things. And then I thought, you know, I keep asking these questions about the aesthetics of joy. I, at that point, had sort of figured out that that's what I was calling it. And so I just, moved all those posts over to this new blog and and that was where I spent all my time and I just kept finding examples and finding stories and that was how it began. So it's really weird for a professor to say that any work anyone does gives them joy but <laughs> but it happened in your case what was it about your work was your professor actually able to identify the sources or was that part of the puzzle for no, you? No that was part of the problem is that they just said you know it's a lot of hand waving. I mean designers love to wave their hands that's like how we communicate. Um, we communicate in like scribbles and also like by waving our hands around. It's a very intuitive discipline. I think that's one of the problems with design is that it is very intuitive and so um, for me I really wanted to understand where this came from, like what was the source of it? And I have to say, so my, my dad is here tonight, um, and I, um, my dad's a, a neurologist, and I, was, I grew up with two doctors as parents. And so I think for me, science was always a part of my upbringing. I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of jargon at the dinner table, you know, there was a lot of, um, but, but I think as a result, I 
really wanted to understand the why. And in design school, there's not a lot of why. There's just a lot of, it's really about the what and, and how it makes people feel. People really care, like designers really care about that, but they don't often, there isn't a bridge between the people who are studying objects and how they make us feel and what's happening in our minds when we encounter things. And so for me, it was this question of how do I bridge that gap and how do I actually bring some of what scientists are discovering into the practice of design? And so, for a while at least, you're, you're doing the blog on the side, and you're doing yeah. design work full time. For a really long time, How actually. How long? Uh, so, I started the blog in 2009, um, and the beginning of 2009, and um, I finished my master's at the end of that year at Pratt, and then I went to work for IDEO that same, uh, I started in 2010 at IDEO in January, and I was working on the blog on the side for six years while I was at IDEO. Um, sometimes with vigor and sometimes not as, you know, sometimes you get caught up in the day to day, um, but it was always there for me. And I think having it became this thread. And, and also some of the early, you know, ha having it become known by people early on in the design field made it easy to always come back to because people thought of me as, you know, the aesthetics of Joy Girl. So it made it this continuing thread even while I was working on other things. And, and one of the crazy things that happened was when I was interviewing at IDEO, um, one of the partners at IDEO had forwarded my blog uh, without knowing I was interviewing to someone who was interviewing me. Love when that happens. Uh, yeah, and it was so <laughs> lucky because then he was like, you know, um, it was Paul who forwarded it to Tom, and Tom said, you know, oh, we're talking to her. And Paul said, great, keep talking. And so that was a good, like, <laughs> early thing that happened. Um, but it was, it was nice because IDEO, you know, said it was, I could keep working on it. They, IDEO is a place that really nurtures people's passions. And so they were really happy to have me working on this on the side. So that, that to me is a great illustration of something that I've, I've told a bunch of people in the room actually, which is that if they want to build uh, opportunities for themselves, of course they need a great network, but that to do that they should spend less time networking and more time actually working. Because 100%. if you put a portfolio out there, right, people can see your contributions and your capabilities and it's a lot easier then to be impressed by you than if you just go and schmooze with a bunch of people. Did you do that deliberately or did it happen by accident? I think I'm naturally a little bit shy. You probably don't know this about me because of the settings in which we've happened to like meet each other. I'm not very shy at IDEO. I'm not IDEO. sure I believe I it, in fact. I wasn't very shy but... at IDEO because I was very comfortable. You know, it was like you were, in, you were in, in a space where I felt really comfortable. But I think in general, like I'm not a real avid networker. And I often have a lot of imposter syndrome about like, you know, what I do and what I've done. And so I'm not the sort of person who like really is good at going out to, you know, to talk to people about my work. And it's only when I, I think I use the work as a way to connect with people. And so being able to put something out there, have people discover it and connect with it, that is how I connect with people. And so I don't know that it was conscious, but I just knew that um, if I kept pulling the thread, and I kept finding things, and the, those were the best conversations I was having, then that was the work I should keep doing. So during those six years, I, I have this vision of you kind of sneaking joy into your projects <laughs> that are supposed to have nothing to do with it. Like, I, I, IDEO is probably most famous for designing the mouse for Apple. Yeah. And I feel like if you could go in a time machine, you would have been like trying to convince Steve Jobs to smile right, yeah. as you were building a mouse. <laughs> um, did you have moments like that where, where joy wasn't part of a project, but then you found ways to work it in? I did. You know, it, it's funny because I think there were times, yes, and probably it's hard to talk about a lot of them because they were, a lot of IDEO's <laughs> projects are confidential, but I think it came in just how I approached everything. Um, so it was just sort of a, a broader lens. Um, I think sometimes I got matched with clients that are known for joy. So I got matched with Target, which worked out really, you know, I love Target and so it was great to work with them um, because joy is actually part of their purpose statement. And so um, things like that would happen, which were really great. And then also I got to work on some things that were totally blue sky that were joy related. So for example, um, we did a project to redesign Monday. 
um, and try the to day? the day, the, the, the experience <laughs> you have on a Monday, right? Monday sucks and <laughs> everyone hates Monday. And so we did a project to redesign Monday. So we looked at like the alarm clock and we made this little alarm clock that um, it, it laughs um, when you when it goes off. So it, it laughs with like a baby's laughter, which is one of the most infectiously <laughs> joyful sounds on earth. Um, and it, it, it rocks. Um, so it's like we called it the tickle talk clock. You have to tickle it to um, turn it off. Um, so we did like really. <laughs> <laughs> just like really fun things. Um, but so wait, this is a job. Yeah, you're saying. this is a okay, job. Yeah, this is a job. So uh, so yeah, so we got to do some conceptual things like that, which were really uh, a way to sort of explore how to bring joy into um, more purposefully into ideas environment. I want to get into to how to do that because I think that there are at least uh, some people around here who feel like there is not enough joy at Penn. Uh, mm. Actually, R Richard Branson came last year, and that was his first observation. Is like, where's all the joy? Like, why, why doesn't anyone have any fun around here? Yeah. I was like, yeah, you definitely came to the wrong Ivy League school. <laughs> but uh, before before we get into some of that, I'm curious to hear now that you're known for for joyfulness. Do you feel like there's a lot of pressure oh, that's to a always good be question. happy? You know, I don't. I don't actually. I think that um, it's been more of a positive feedback loop for me. Um, so I think knowing that I'm, well, one of the things is that people are coming to me with joyful stuff all the time. Literally in my Instagram, in my DMs, in my email, like there's, I just saw this and thought of you. So there's really nothing better than like if you're having a bad day and then you look and then your inbox is filled with things to make you smile. So I think that what has happened is it feels like there's a community building that understands that, you know, the more that we put into the world, the more it gives us back. Um, so I don't feel that kind of pressure. I feel that it actually gives me more than more than the energy takes. I mean, of course, it's energy, but the, you know, I, it's not a, a pressure. I would say. So your next book is definitely not going to be about depression. Then. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. So how did you decide to make the leap and leave this design career and say, I'm going to write, I'm going to speak, I'm going to strike out on my own? Yeah. Wow. Um, I. Um, so I had been working, I mean, you were a big part of that leap, actually. You know uh -oh. that. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I had been working at IDEO, and I, and I loved that work. Um, and I also sort of felt like I knew that I wanted this to be a book. And I felt that, and I'd known that for a long time, but I also felt like it was hard um, to get over the hump. And in fact, I, I think I had a lot of feelings of failure around it for a period of time because um, so my fir I had been introduced to an agent and I met with her and she was really excited about it. And in the time between when I had like first met with her and how long it had taken me to t try to work on my proposal, she had left the field of agenting entirely. <laughs> she was like no longer even an agent. Um, and that filled me with such a feeling of failure because I was like, oh my God, I had an agent and she's not even an agent anymore. Like, <laughs> how bad at this am I oh, that no. I like can't get it together to finish this book? And um, when I met you and you had actually offered an introduction um, to, uh, I, I was not ready. I was actually like, oh, I'm still not ready. And it was only... Um, it was only this feeling of like, well, what do I have to lose? I might as well try. Um, and, you know, at that point, I had done so much work that it, it actually had a certain momentum. Um, so, I, you know, once I, once I was willing to share it, um, at that point, the feedback became like, actually, this is a book. It could be a book. You should try, you know, writing it. And so that you know, that sort of one thing led to another in that regard. I think what's interesting to me is I sometimes see people write about how, like, you should have a, a thick file of rejections by, by the time you get to, like, your first book. And I actually think that's really good advice, and I was too scared to take that advice. And so I actually just, like, protected it for so long. And it, it ended up working out. But I actually think had I shared it sooner and gotten feedback sooner and been a little braver, um, it might have been better for me um, because the process might have had more momentum to it. So it's interesting to see just how much momentum it had once I actually was willing to share it with people. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk about how, how you actually create joy or find yeah. it. 
Um, I, I feel like you know, I, I meet a lot of, of kind of aspiring authors where they explain their ideas. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of related to something that's already been done, or maybe that could work. And you were in a, a category of your own, which was you, you started talking about the aesthetics of joy. And I was like, this is one, this is a book. Two, this is an idea that I have not seen anyone write about, which is that I always thought joy came from the inside or from our interactions. And you're like, no, it's actually designed all around you. Mm -hmm. Like, OK, as somebody who's completely artistically clueless, I would like to know more about this. <laughs> um, at minimum, I would like to one day go to a museum and feel some joy. Mm. Um, and so <laughs> I, I'd love to, to hear, for starters, what are some of the key principles of designing an environment that is joyful? Um, and are we sitting in one right now? <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, well, let me back up and talk a little bit about the aesthetics of joy and how this all came about, how this came about. So once I started to uh, to once I started to explore this question of how do things create joy, because I had the same biases that you know it's internal that we're and especially I think as a culture we're told that our stuff is supposed to be incidental and that we should be able to be happy anywhere that we should be able to turn inward and ref, and be able to find our sort of inner paradise wherever we go and we should be able to turn tune out whatever stuff is in our environment that might be annoying or draining or whatever that we should be able to rise above that right um, and so as I started to explore this, I started asking people about the things that brought them joy. I, I, um, I started to notice that there were certain patterns, visual patterns um, and sensorial patterns. And um, they were things like bright color, right? We see bright color in festivals. If you go anywhere in the world, you go to a festival, you see bright color. And if you try to imagine that festival, and you take all the decorations and you make them like black and gray, you turn them into monochrome, like something's missing, right? So, um, so that seemed to be like one of these aesthetics of joy. Um, and then uh, nature, you know, we find so much joy in nature. And so that was another. Um, we find joy in round shapes, like all of the shapes of childhood are round. Um, so hula hoops and balloons and balls and spinning tops and carousels and merry-go-rounds, like all of childhood is round. And even like children themselves are round, right? They're like <laughs> rounder versions of adults. Like, and this is biological. They're rounder for a reason because they have higher percentage of body fat and this is what makes them cute. And, you know, there's a whole, um, there's a whole set of features called the baby schema that, that actually like makes them appear cute to us. That's why um, cartoons look cute, and also why like uh, ot you know baby otter videos on on uh, on social media are so addictive, right? Because they're so they sort of speak to this impulse. So anyway, so I started noticing all these features, and um, and that's what became the aesthetics of joy was basically being able to kind of decode. It was like having a decoder ring for joy, for these things that spark joy within us. Um, so uh, I've mentioned a few, bright color is one. Um, and what I thought was interesting was when I started to research these specific aesthetics, I started to find you know, insights that showed, studies that showed um, that they influence our performance and our, and our well-being. And so for example, you know, studies that show that bright color um, in work environments makes people more alert, Friendly, confident, joyful, interested—like um, that's a—you know—that's something that um, means that this isn't just something an idle pleasure, but it actually influences our functioning. Um, same with light, right? We love a sunny day, and we can sort of dismiss that and just think, "Oh, like a sunny day is just a trivial pleasure." But in fact, um, you know, the research shows that light has a profound influence. It regulates our circadian rhythms, and that that has all sorts of other knock-on effects. That people who work in sunnier desks, for example, are more active. And actually, people who have more light exposure are more active. Young people are more active um, when they have more light exposure during the day, natural or artificial. So there are all these sorts of things that show that our environments can influence our well-being in a, in a profound way. How do you reconcile that with, I feel like the most productive I've ever been in my yeah. life was in the middle of a Michigan winter. <laughs> there's literally nothing you can do but work. Nothing. That's true. And there's a, there's a Francesca Gino study recently showing that, in, uh, that people are more productive on bad weather days and in bad yeah. weather areas than good weather. Yeah. So I think that maybe there's probably a tension between different kinds of work. That would be my mm -hmm. guess, um, is that there is, um, you know, if you think about the broaden and build theory um, and the idea that we are more um, 
exploratory um, in positive moods, that we are more sort of open, probably more likely to be creative. We have higher cognitive flexibility. Um, I think that probably there are certain types of work that are really best done in isolation, no distractions in like a quiet room. And then there are probably other kinds of work that are best done um, in more sort of livelier surroundings. Um, so yeah, I think that there, you can look at modes. Like for example, I think it's interesting, this study out of Japan that shows that looking at cute things increases focus and concentration. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting because um, it, it, it makes sense because um, cute things prompt a nurturing impulse. Nurturing is a focused act. Um, and so the idea that when we look at you know, these, these cute animals, that that might actually make us better at concentrating makes sense yeah. to me. Um, so I think it's, you're tuning your environment for the kind mm -hmm. of work you want to do. That also reminds me of John Haidt's research showing that uh, if you see pictures of puppies and kittens, you then make fewer errors on tasks, which is sort of a acuteness leading to behavioral carefulness, which totally. is probably related to the, same the nurturing idea. Exactly, same thing, yeah. Is this why I keep getting student requests for a petting zoo on campus? <laughs> <laughs> That I don't know, but I think it's not a bad idea. We could experiment. We had a day at IDEA where um, we had puppies come. They just came, like they, I don't know, they just arrived, like puppies arrived. <laughs> like these are and our was, new designers. It was amazing. It we was value like, species diversity. I think it was, yeah. it, was, it was a part of like a, you know, IDEO has all sorts of joy initiatives to sort of bring uh, the light into the workplace and that was one and it was a really, um, it was just a wonderful day. I, I think uh, things like that certainly um, they help because I think you know the research that connects joy and um, productivity. I mean, there is research that shows that joy enhances productivity. There's research that shows that um, that joyful leaders are more effective leaders. Um, so yeah, I think there is probably a connection, whether it's puppies or something else. Where do you draw the boundaries on that? So our own Nancy Rothbard has uh, some research on firefighters uh, showing that when their cultures are highly jovial, mm. uh, that they actually sometimes struggle from a performance perspective. Oh, interesting. Uh, maybe they don't take their work seriously enough or you know, they're joking around too much. Yeah. Is there a boundary on that, you think? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, again, I think um, there, I know that there's, there are conflicting. There's like a, a sort of, um, it's an emerging space, right? And so I think we're still trying to parse out like which effective states are best for which kind of work. Um, and so it's possible, you know, I don't know. I mean, that type of work is a very intense environment. It's not a typical um, like office type environment. And so I, I wonder like how we generalize and how mm -hmm. we find, um, again, the right kinds of environments for the right yep. kinds of work. So I'm not letting you off the hook. Uh -huh. uh, you should have seen the room before the redesign. Oh yes, but right. Okay. What would you What would you do to bring more well, joy into this room? So I think um, the first thing to observe. So there's a little color, but not a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I would start with color. Um, I think uh, there's sort of some roundness in the way that the desks are arranged. Maybe I'm reaching. Um, I think nature is a thing that seems to be missing and it's missing from a lot of our man-made spaces and I think we just sort of take it for granted that that indoor spaces don't have natural elements we have some natural we have this here um, but I don't imagine this is here when classes are in session yeah this, this is like token nature <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah so I think um, but bringing in the I think the research on nature and uh, the way that it influences well-being and functioning is pretty clear um, that it helps restore our attention it helps us uh, concentrate and focus um, and there's some research that even suggests that we're more generous um, when we're in the presence of indoor plants so I think that um, yeah, nature is, is definitely something I would look at bringing in here. You pointed out that we often have sort of the worst aesthetics and the, the least joy in the places we need it most. So yes. hospitals, schools, maybe prisons. Yes. Have you, have you been doing any work to try to bring more joy into those environments? And what does it look like? That is a good question. I'm actually getting, uh, now since the TED Talk actually, more requests 
for that kind of work. And so I'm starting to look at different ways to do that. Um, up until now, I've really focused on sort of amplifying organizations that are already doing that. So like, I'm not going to go into schools because I know Public Color is doing that, right? Um, mm -hmm. I just uh, spoke last week at a healthcare design conference and was talking to people about that. Um, in hospitals and in those kinds of environments. So I'm starting to look at like where are the places that I can have the highest impact. But I think, you know, health the health facilities, I mean, it's tricky because there's a lot of um, a lot of regulations. But I do think, you know, people have had success with it. And um, I just was in London and I met uh, this woman, Morag Myerskoff. She's an artist and she uh, does, um, she does a lot of installations in hospitals, and one is in the Sheffield Children's Hospital. It's this beautiful installation. And she said that when she first went in, um, that the nurses were really nice to her when she showed her designs. She does really bold, colorful designs. When she first showed them, um, the nurses were really nice to her, and then they said, uh, to their bosses, they said, uh, "Please don't ever let that woman come back. She's going to she's going to kill the children. <laughs> like this is really bad." And but she went and she took the designs and she showed them to the parents and the kids. And like ninety two percent of the parents and kids wanted more color in the rooms. And so her designs were eventually implemented and and they won over the nurses. And so it became um, a real success story. So I think it can be done. And my hope is, I, I think the question is which spaces to start with. But yeah, it's definitely something I'm looking at. That makes me curious about cross-cultural reactions to joy. So yeah. um, there's, a, there's a bunch of research suggesting that if you look at ideal emotions, right? Ideal emotions in the US are around joy and exuberance. Yes. But if you go to most Southeast Asian cultures, people are much more interested in calm and mm -hmm. peacefulness and mm -hmm. tranquility. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny that you bring up Sheffield because uh, my wife and I lived there for a while uh, on a sabbatical 11 years ago. Yeah. And it's like the dreariest part of Northern England and it's steel country. And people think playing like snooker billiards is fun. And that's pretty much all that happened there. Right. And at some point, I pointed out that you know that like people seemed pretty glum on average, yeah. and I got all this pushback. People were like, "Oh, you you Americans, like, you you just you just want everyone to be happy all the time, and uh -huh. it's just not it's not realistic." Yes. And I felt like there was not the same appetite in the UK for joy that there is here. That's so funny. <laughs> and I wonder, we actually we have a, a colleague here in the management department who's British, and he uh, he self identifies as a constant source of what he calls BNA, which is British negative affect. <laughs> and I'm wondering, as you go around the world, do you do you see this reaction? It sounds like in Sheffield you didn't. Well, so I, um, one of them, uh, that's interesting. So I was just over in the UK, and I would say one of the most negative reactions I've had to the book, though he didn't read it. He just sort of, um, he just, it was just to the talk. But um, one of the most negative reactions I've ever had was in, uh, was in London, and also uh, I had, I've had an out, outpouring of positive support as well. So I think that there are people who feel that the culture is missing it mm -hmm. and really want it. And then there are also people who are resistant to it. Um, I, I know what you mean about Southeast Asia. What's, an interesting conversation I had in Japan, didn't make it into the book, but it was an interesting conversation I had in Japan, was I actually was talking to an architect about this idea of calm and this idea of joy. And I was like, is it more calm or is it more joy? And he's like, it's interesting that you think that those two things are opposed. And I thought that was really interesting, right? So that that actually, um, the, that there might be a, an, a more expansive definition of joy that isn't, uh, that you can find serenity and, and delight and that those two things might be overlapping. So that there might be different, I, I often think about it as like different emotional territories that intersect with each other and they intersect in different ways. It's kind of like the research on awe and how in China, like there's a more, probably more of a threat-based definition of awe, whereas here we tend more toward the positive. Like I think that these territories sort of overlap each other. And so probably there are different cultural overlays, but I don't know, this idea that, um, the interpretation that we want people to be happy all the time, I actually think is something I'm trying to fight against. Because I believe that joy is not a state of being, it is an emotion. And the whole idea of this work is just that we feel it a little more often. And that we also should feel all the other range of our emotions too. We should feel the lows. We should really acknowledge the lows. Because I don't think we will feel... Um, I don't think we feel true joy if we don't feel true sorrow as well, when, when, it ex when we experience it. And so... Mm -hmm. 
um, for me, it's more about exploring the full range of our emotions and expanding that. Are there steps you've taken to bring more joy into your life since you started becoming an expert on this topic? I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm still learning, actually. Expert's a funny word to use because I, I still feel like I'm learning. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I wear a lot more color than I used to. Um, colorful shoes. I paint my nails in rainbow colors um, because when I'm sitting at the keyboard and I have a long day of work and a long day of email, it's actually really nice to see something <laughs> colorful. I, I can't control. I can't always control my environment, but I actually can control what's on me and what's with me. Um, I also noticed that it changes the way people react to me. Um, so you know, you can start little ripple effects based on what you're wearing. Um, I definitely changed the way that my house is decorated and bringing in plants. I know I keep talking about plants, but plants probably were one of the most transformative things because I spent, you know, my 20s very nomadic. I moved around a lot. I moved apartments a lot. And I sort of thought, okay, plants isn't something that I can have. And when I actually finally realized, oh, I, I'm not moving around all the time. I can take care. I can take care of a plant. I probably can't take care of a pet, but I can definitely take care of like a succulent, you know? Um, and so I think I can keep this thing alive. And so I started bringing in more and more. And now it's almost like an addiction. Like I definitely have, like I sort of propagate them. I, you know, um, but it, it does change the quality of indoor space to have something that moves, something that's alive, something that's green. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's another big shift. And, and like actually, I'll just say, I think that um, I have changed my life to focus more on small joys and less on this broad idea of happiness. Because I actually think it's always going to be elusive if you think that you're going to reach this like state of happiness. It doesn't happen. And so instead, I focus on things like uh, you know, I started playing tennis again because it brings me joy. It's so much fun to go run around after a ball. Like, I, you know, and we and most of us don't get to do that when we're adults. And so actually I'm terrible at it, but it's really fun. Um, you know, I, I still haven't done this, but um, I, I'm like guitar shopping because I always wanted to learn to play the guitar. I'm like, what am I waiting for? More music in my life sounds like a good thing. And playing music sounds better than listening to it. So I'm going to do that. So yeah, I think a lot more about the small joys. I'm curious about the, the colorful dress step. Mm -hmm. Are, do you ever feel like people take you less seriously? Or do people ever come concerned that they're going to be you know, seen as unprofessional or Pollyanna? Oh, totally. I have so many people on my Instagram who like will comment on this um, when I talk about this because so many people have told me that they feel like they have uh, been, you know, told that, for example, when they buy things, accessories for themselves, people are like, are that, is that for your child? Um, and, and they'll say, no, actually, that's for me. Um, and uh, and that, they, that they feel really dismissed. And I think that this you know, is this deep cultural bias that we have where we equate, um, in the book I talk about Goethe and I talk about how, you know, in 1810 in his theory of colors, he said, um, savage nations, uneducated people and children typically prefer vivid colors and, and people of refinement avoid vivid colors. And this has sort of been a, a repeating strain. It comes up in modernism a lot. It's been sort of a, a continuous thread in our culture. And so I do feel like that is an issue it's not such an issue with me because people expect it of me. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, I feel like um, people are, are prepared to accept that I'm going to be wearing color. Um, but I do recognize that um, people do have that. I think it also cuts the other way. I have a friend who um, I think has at times felt like she might come off as intimidating. She's very tall. And so um, one of the things, wearing bright color is a way to make herself more disarming. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my feeling is we should all be dressing to be more approachable and more and less intimidating. And <laughs> so if we do that, um, it just makes us all a little like friendlier to each other. What do you say to the, the people? It, it almost sounds like there's some people in every culture who are kind of like the dementors from Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> They're just they like are. determined to suck all the joy totally. out of everyone's yeah. attire. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you say to people who take that stance? Um, what do I say to them? I mean, to some extent, it's hard to convince people. You know, you're not going to convince people that, that if, if, that's the, if that's the space that people want to occupy, it's going to be hard for me to talk them out of it. I think more I focus on making the making things available so that when people might want a you know a glimpse of a different way of doing things, um, the information is there for them. 
Um, but I do talk about the connection to performance, the connection to well-being. Uh, you know, that's one way in. It just, it tends to be a mindset shift mm -hmm. that has to happen. And so I had a, a woman who contacted me after one of my talks, and she told me that uh, when she was first, um, uh, when she, she she had to be dragged to my talk, she didn't want to come. Uh, and it's always a good start. Yeah, yeah, right. She didn't want to come. She considered herself not a happy person, not a joyful person. She And her way of seeing the world was that there are joyful people and they're not joyful people. And I'm just unfortunately not one. And that's not going to be my lot in life. And she said that when I talked about joy spotting, which is the idea of like going out into the world and it's kind of like a mindfulness exercise, but it's specifically focused on spotting joy in your surroundings, seeing things, noticing things that bring you a feeling of joy. When I talked about that, she said, well, it's free and it's easy and uh, no one has to know I'm doing it. And so she said, okay, I'll try it. You know, that was what she told herself and then she did it and she said, actually, I did see it. I did see joy where, and, I, and then I started seeing more of it and then it started. So for her, it was actually... You know, I didn't even need to have the conversation with her because I was having yeah. it sort of at, at large scale. But it did um, that that took root by having her try something. So I think maybe it comes more down to trying something rather than being able to convince someone because I don't think mm -hmm. you can be convinced in that way. What surprised you the most that you've learned about joy? Oh my God, so many things. I mean, maybe this thing that I was sort of saying about um, the depth, like that. That joy, that the amplitude of our joy is, I think, also connected to the amplitude of our ability to feel sorrow, and that um, uh, that really what we should be striving for is not constant happiness, but a um, but a rich emotional life. I think that, and maybe that in some way, all of this research on joy has actually deepened my ability to feel. Um, the hard things in life, that I've actually just become more um, emotionally aware as a person. And I think that um, just fundamentally the physiological nature of emotions, understand when you understand that, I think you can also understand when things start to deceive you. For example, like that having too much caffeine in a day can make you so anxious, right? Like in, that, that there's sort of like a backwards relationship sometimes, that your body can start to have responses that feel like emotions that aren't actually there. Um, so understanding the, like, understanding how physical it all is, then it makes perfect sense why your environment would have an effect on you because your environment is having an effect on your senses. Your senses are having an effect on your physiology and, and all of that is turning into sort of uh, these emotional responses in your brain. Um, so yeah, when I first, I, I think it, gives the lie to the idea that emotions are this thing that's all in your head. You know, it's actually in your head, in your body. It's, it's, it's a full body experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to open it up for audience questions yeah. in just a minute. Uh, two questions we'd love to ask every mm -hmm. author before we do that. First one is, what's the one book that everyone in this room should read oh besides yours? Oh my god, oh my god. OK, uh, I'm going to go with a pattern language. Does anyone, has anyone read a parent, anyone out here no, a pattern language. OK, a pattern language is a book um, by, it's a group of authors. I think it was done in the 60s or 70s, I think, um, by Christopher Alexander at Berkeley and, it, and, and a, a number of co-authors. And the book is um, about patterns for um, building. And he looks at architecture. He looks at spaces um, and breaks them down from the very largest to the very smallest. Um, and he looks at. Uh, everything from in cities, for example, why um, in, a, in a good city, a, a plaza, like a good um, public space, always has a thing in the center, like and why that is. Or he'll look at you know. Are why, you going to tell us, or are you going to leave us hanging uh, to read the book? I, I think I, I actually don't remember the answer. I just know that it's a fact that all the best <laughs> plazas have these centers of gravity. Um, or for example, that. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book that I drew from pattern language is that um, they did a study of yards and they found that people almost always use their outdoor space when it's on the south side 
um, but not on the north side because the sun passes across the southern, um, so, uh, you know, and of course in the southern hemisphere this is reversed because the sun passes across the southern part of the sky and so those areas are sunlit and we are photophilic and so of course, you know, in a shady, in a shady yard you'll never use it. So I think that um, what I love about this book is it explains the connection between humans and and space um, in a in a very um, timeless way, and it's and it's just you know it's it's a giant. That's like a dictionary, so you probably want to take it like you know a pattern every now and then. But it's it's sort of you can dive into it, and um, it's just a really wonderful timeless meditation on the way that we interact with the world around us. And then, what is the worst career advice you've ever received? Oh my God, the worst career advice! I know it, I know it. Um, the worst career advice I ever received. Um, was that someone told me that I had to build a huge following before anyone would seriously look at my book. And so um, I got this advice. Um, it was really well-intentioned, I think. Um, but but <laughs> I was. I think she was really trying to help me, and she felt that, like, you know, I needed And so um, what that made me feel was immediately insecure, that I did not have enough of, like, a following on social platforms or whatever to to sort of get my idea out there. And it made me move toward a mode of thinking that I had to grow that instead of just working on the idea. And it really distracted me for a period of time. So yeah, that was terrible advice. So I think for me, like, you know, in some cases, maybe that's good advice if you're like, if that's what you're good at is building a follow, building a community. But for me, I'm an idea person. And I think the work was to work on the idea. And so, you know, I'm glad that eventually I found my way back to the idea. I am too. Yeah. I think it's, it's really exciting to learn about joy from someone who actually brings more of it into the world. And I think we could all use more of that. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.